If you've ever owned a Commodore 64, you didn't just play games, you heard them. That glorious, crunchy, electric pulse of the SID chip wasn't background noise, it was the soul of the machine. This wasn't just beeps and bloops like the ZX Spectrum. The c 64 SID chip could scream, sing and shred like a digital guitar hero trapped inside a beige keyboard. And the wizards who commanded it, they were the rock stars of the 8-bit world. Let's talk about the legends, the maestros who turned silicon into symphonies. The SID, short for Sound Interface Device, was created by Bob Jans at Moz Technology back in 1982. And fun fact, Jans wasn't just an engineer, he was a musician. He wanted a sound chip that could actually express something, not just chirp out So he built this monstrous little thing with three oscillators, filters, envelopes, ring modulation, all packed into a tiny chip that cost less than a decent lunch. It was, quite literally, a mini synthesizer inside your home computer. Rob Hubbard didn't just compose for games, he performed with code. Using raw assembly language, he squeezed sounds out of the SID that nobody thought possible. The Commodore had just come out and that was advertised as having this, you know, a lot of memory and it had a sound chip and I thought, well, that looks like something a bit more interesting than these other machines. So that's what I decided to get. One thing that people used to do at that time was, you know, used to look in the documentation and, uh, you know, get, get these registers, 8-bit registers, which had bit patterns to, you know, toggle certain uh, aspects of the, the sound. And, um, Sometimes you could like set two bits and get something completely different that wasn't in the documentation. Well, there were certain things on the SID chip that you could do, like the, the hard sync and the ring modulation, which is something that I knew about because I'd worked with since. There were a few other, other things that you could do that weren't documented and you would just set a couple of bits and get a, a, a strange new waveform. Hubbard made the SID sound alive, bending waveforms, syncing arpeggios, layering fake drums and making the C64 feel like a rock concert. And the best part, he did it all while working within memory limits that would make your smartwatch laugh. This wasn't background music, this was identity. The SID was the C64. While Hubbard went for energy and musical muscle, Martin Galway went for atmosphere. He was the first to use digitised samples on the C64, squeezing snippets of real audio into memory so small you'd barely fit a sentence in it. He gave us moody masterpieces like Ocean Loader, Times of Lore, Whizball and Rambo. Galway's work had this cinematic quality, he once said that programming the SID was like making a Stradivarius out of plastic. And you know what? He wasn't wrong. The magazines like Zap64 and Commodore User and those other ones, they were basically your only feedback. There was no like forums, there's no internet, no you know, thousands of users all giving you feedback. Um, you had really no idea, unless you happened to stand around in W8 Smiths and go, hey, uh, hey lad, I did the music on that. And he'd be like, you know what? You know, you wouldn't be able to really convince anyone that you worked on a game. Then there was Ben Daglish, the cheeky grin of the C64 music scene. A guy who could walk into a room, pull out a flute, and play one of his own game tunes live. Daglish wasn't just a coder, he was a born performer. His collaborations with Anthony Lees on The Last Ninja gave us one of the most iconic game soundtracks of the entire 8-bit era. He understood something fundamental. The SID 
wasn't just a tool, it was an instrument, and he treated it like one. Now let's not forget David Whittaker. If the C64 scene were a band, Whittaker was the guy who wrote half the songs on the album. He was everywhere. Lazy Jones, Shadow of the Beast, Glider Rider, Street Surfer. His style was clean, catchy and technically sharp. He proved that great game music didn't always have to shout, sometimes it just had to groove. And then the fans took over. The demo scene exploded, with coders and musicians pushing the Sid even further. Names like Jerowin Tell, Rain Uihand and Mike Gray. All creating soundtracks so good, they outshone the games themselves. Matt Gray's Last Ninja 2 soundtrack, still legendary. You could walk into a C64 convention today, hum a few bars, and suddenly, ten grown men will nod at you in solemn respect. Even today, Sid music lives on, remixed, remastered, performed live by symphony orchestras and EDM artists who weren't even born when it was written. There are entire festivals dedicated to it, and you can still find people coding new Sid tracks in 2025 on the original hardware. Because somehow, this little 8-bit chip managed to do what few modern systems can. It connected with us. It didn't have the fidelity of a modern synthesizer, but it had soul. It growled. It shimmered. It broke the rules, just like the people who used it. So next time you hear that familiar electric pulse, remember, you're not just listening to a game soundtrack, you're listening to history. The Commodore 64 SID chip wasn't just sound hardware, it was an art, rebellion, and pure digital genius, all humming away inside that little red power light. And that's why, even after 40 years, the SID still slaps. Thanks for watching guys, hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, and don't forget to subscribe for more Commodore 64 nostalgia. Check out the other games on the ever-growing playlists, and hopefully, I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, bye for now. Thank you to the following Patreons for your continued support, and also those who join the YouTube membership. You guys really are the lifeblood for the channel, and spur me on to continue making these nostalgic videos. Much love, and thank you once again. Stay retro.